Good evening and welcome to Evening Prayer for Wednesday, July 15th. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of man. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. The king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation, and by its might it cannot rescue. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart is glad in him, because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. New Testament reading this evening is a continuation of our reading from Galatians 3. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of this world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world, whose slaves you want to be once more? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid I may have labored over you in vain. Our Book of Concord reading tonight is The False Repentance of the Papists, uh, Conclusion, and then uh, Article 4, the Gospel, Article 5, Baptism, Article 6, the Lord's Supper, and Article 7, the Keys. All of those articles are quite short. Let's see, where did we leave off? Mm. Ah, I think it's right here. Uh, Luther was talking about uh, the Jubilee years and the, the different indulgences that they made in the private masses for raising money and also for setting people free from uh, purgatory. And then Luther continues... But all this too did nothing, 
even though the Pope taught people to depend on and trust these indulgences for salvation, he made the matter uncertain again. In his bulls, he declares that whoever wants to share in the indulgences, or a golden year, has to be contrite and have confessed and pay money. We have already seen how, with the papacy, contrition and confession are uncertain and hypocritical, because no one knew what soul was in purgatory. If some souls were in purgatory, no one knew who had properly repented and confessed. So the Pope took the precious money, comforting people with his power and indulgence, but then he directed them again to their uncertain works. Now, some did not believe themselves guilty of actual sins in thought, words, and deeds. I and people like me in monasteries and religious communities wanted to be monks and priests. We fought against evil thoughts by doing such things as fasting, staying awake, praying, saying mask, wearing, wearing coarse garments, and sleeping on hard beds. In total sincerity and with great effort, we wanted to be holy. Yet the hereditary inborn evil sometimes came out in sleep, as happens. St. Augustine and St. Jerome, among others, also confess this. Still, each one held the other in high esteem. According to our teaching, some monks were regarded as holy, without sin, and full of good works. Also, since we had more good works than we needed to get to heaven, we could communicate and sell our good works to others. This is actually true. Seals, letters, and examples are at hand to prove that this happened. These holy ones did not need repentance. What would they need to, to repent of, since they had not indulged their wicked thoughts? What would they confess about words they never said? What should they render satisfaction for, since they were so guiltless that they could even sell their extra righteousness to poor sinners? In the time of Christ, the Pharisees and scribes were these kinds of saints. See Matthew 23. But here comes the fiery angel of St. John, Revelation 10 the true preacher of repentance. With one bolt of lightning he hurls together both those selling and those buying works. He says, repent. Now one group imagines, why have we repented? The other says, we have no need of repentance. John says, repent, both of you, you false penitents and false saints. Both of you need the forgiveness of sins. Neither of you know what sin really is, much less your duty to repent of it and shun it. For no one of you is good. You are full of unbelief, stupidity, and ignorance of God and God's will. But he is present here, of whose fullness we have all received grace upon grace. Without him, no one can be righteous before God. Therefore, if you want to repent, repent rightly. Your works of penance will accomplish nothing. As for you hypocrites, who do not need repentance, you serpents brood, who has assured you that you will escape the wrath to come in other judgments? Matthew 3, 7, Luke 3, 7. In the same way, Paul also preaches, None is righteous, no, not one, no one understands, no one seeks for God, all have turned aside. Together they have become worthless, no one does good, not even one. Romans three ten to 12 And God now commands all people everywhere to repent. All people, he says. No one is an exception who is a human being. This repentance teaches us to discern sin. We are completely lost. There is nothing good in us from head to foot, and we must become absolutely new and different people. Such repentance is not partial and beggarly, like that which does penance for actual sins, nor, like that, is it uncertain. For it does not debate what is or is not sin. Rather, it hurls everything together and says, everything in us is nothing but sin. There is nothing in us that is not sin and guilt. Romans 7.18 what is the use of always investigating, dividing, or distinguishing? This contrition is certain, for we cannot think of any good thing to pay for sin. There is nothing left. There is only a sure despairing about all that we are, think, speak, do, and so on. Confession, too, cannot be false, uncertain, or fragmentary. A person who confesses that everything in him is nothing but sin includes all sins, excludes none, forgets none. Neither can the satisfaction be uncertain, because it is not our uncertain sinful work. Rather, it is the suffering and blood of the innocent Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the repentance John the Baptist preaches, and afterward Christ does this in the gospel, and so do we. By this preaching of repentance, we dash to the ground the Pope and everything built upon our good works, for all of that is built upon a rotten and vain foundation, which is called a good work or law. And yet this foundation has no good works, but only wicked works. 
No one keeps the law, as Christ says, but all transgress it. Therefore, the building that is raised upon that rotten foundation is nothing but falsehood and hypocrisy, even where it seems most holy and beautiful. In Christians, this repentance continues until death, for through one's entire life, repentance contends with the sin remaining in the flesh. Paul testifies that he wars with the law in his members, Romans 7, 14-25, not by his own powers, but by the gift of the Holy Spirit that follows the forgiveness of sins, Romans 8, 1-17. This gift daily cleanses and sweeps out the remaining sins and works to make a person truly pure and holy. The Pope, the theologians, the church lawyers, and the rest know nothing about this, but it is a doctrine from heaven revealed through the gospel, and the godless saints must call it heresy. On the other hand, certain sects may arise, some may already exist. During the peasant rebellion, I encountered some who held that those who had once received the spirit of the forgiveness of sins or had become believers, even if they later sin, would still remain in the faith. Such sin, they think, would not harm them. They say, do whatever you pleased. If you believe, it all amounts to nothing. Faith blots out all sins and such. They also say that if anyone sins after he has received faith in the Spirit, he never truly had the Spirit and faith. I have seen and heard many such madmen. I fear that such a devil is still in some of them. So it is necessary to know and to teach this. When holy people, still having and feeling original sin and daily repenting and striving against it, happen to fall into manifest sins, as David did into adultery, murder, and blasphemy, 2 Samuel 11, then faith in the Holy Spirit have left them. The Holy Spirit does not permit sin to have dominion, to gain the upper hand so it can be carried out, but represses and restrains it from doing what it wants. If sin does what it wants, the Holy Spirit and faith are not present. For St. John says, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning, and he cannot keep on sinning. And yet it is also true when St. John says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And actually, yeah, yeah, we could still do all these. These are short. Okay, Article 4, The Gospel. We will now return to the gospel, which does not give counsel and aid against sin in only one way. God is superabundantly generous in his grace. First, through the spoken word by which the forgiveness of sins is preached in the whole world. This is the particular office of the gospel. Second, through baptism. Third, through the holy sacrament of the altar. Fourth, through the power of the keys. Also, through the mutual conversation and consolation of brethren, where two or three are gathered Matthew 18.20, and other such verses. Article 5. Baptism. Baptism is nothing other than God's word in the water, commanded by his institution. As St. Paul says, it is a washing with the word. As St. Augustine says, when the word is joined to the element or natural substance, it becomes a sacrament. This is why we do not agree with Thomas Aquinas and the monastic preachers who forgot the word, God's institution. They say that God has imparted to the water a spiritual power which, through the water, washes away sin. Nor do we agree with Scotus and the barefooted monks, who teach that baptism washes away sins by the assistance of the divine will. They believe this washing occurs only through God's will, and not at all through the word or the water. Of the baptism of children, we hold that children should be baptized, for they belong to the promised redemption made through Christ. Acts 2.39. Therefore, the church should administer baptism to them. Article 6. The Sacrament of the Altar. Of the sacrament of the altar, we hold that the bread and wine in the supper are Christ's true body and blood. These are given and received not only by the godly, but also by wicked Christians. 1 Corinthians 11.29 and 30. We do not hold that only one kind of the sacrament is to be given, e.g. the bread alone. We do not need that high reasoning that teaches there is as much under the one kind as under both, as the sophists and the Council of Constance teach. Even if that were true, giving the one kind only is not the entire ordinance and institution commanded by Christ. We especially condemn and in God's name curse those who not only refuse to give both kinds, but also quite tyrannically prohibit, condemned, and blaspheme, giving both kinds as heresy. In doing so, they exalt themselves against and above Christ, our Lord and God. 
As for transubstantiation, we care nothing about the sophistic cunning by which they teach that bread and wine leave or lose their own natural substance, so that only the appearance and color of bread remain, and not true bread. For it is in perfect agreement with holy scriptures that there is and remains bread, as Paul himself calls it, the bread that we break, and let a person so eat of the bread. Article 7. The Keys the keys are an office and power given by Christ to the church for binding and loosing sin, Matthew 16, 19. This applies not only to gross and well-known sins, but also to the subtle, hidden sins that are known only to God. And as it is written, who can discern his errors, Psalm 19, 12. And St. Paul himself complains that with my flesh I serve the law of sin, Romans seven twenty five. It is not in our power to judge which, how great, and how many the sins are. This belongs to God alone. As it is written, enter not into judgment with your servant, for no one living is righteous before you. Paul says, I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. 1 Corinthians 4.4 4. And tomorrow we will read the article on confession, excommunication, and ordination. And then the uh, Thursday and then Friday we will complete uh, these small called articles. We now join in the Apostles' Creed and the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. God the Father in heaven, have mercy. God the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy. God the Holy Spirit, have mercy. Be gracious to us, spare all the dying. From all sin, from all evil, from the devil's might, from the devil's wiles, from your wrath and from hell's torment, from sudden and evil death, good Lord, deliver them. By the mystery of your holy incarnation, by your holy nativity, by your agony and bloody sweat, by your cross and passion, by your precious death and burial, by your glorious resurrection and ascension, and by the grace of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. Help them, good Lord. In the hour of death on the day of judgment, help them, good Lord. We poor sinners implore you to hear us, good Lord. To comfort all the dying, to forgive them all their sins, to lead them out of this misery into eternal life, we implore you to hear us, good Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, we implore you to hear us. Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy. Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy. Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, grant us your peace. O Christ, hear us. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, you came in humility and weakness to defeat the powers of sin, death, and the devil. Clothe our weakness with your righteousness by your baptismal grace that we might withstand the power of every adversary. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul in all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.